Yes. Hello, and welcome to the third installment of this webinar series focused on navigating the shift to competency-based medical education brought to you by STFM and the AFMRD. Today's webinar is titled, Let's Talk About Entrustment, and features Dr. Chris Emily McCroy, Associate Program Director at the Cheshire Med Dartmouth Health Family Medicine Residency Program, and Dr. Lauren Anderson, Assistant Professor and Director of Educational Programs for Rush University's Department of Family and Preventative Medicine. During this webinar, please utilize the Q&A feature to ask questions of the panelists. Although you may ask questions at any time, designated time has been set aside to answer your questions toward the end of the presentation. We hope to see you at our next webinar, Assessment Tools for CBME and the Core Outcomes on April 10th. You may register for this webinar and access the previous webinars in this series at stfm.org slash CBME webinars. Dr. McCroy will now begin today's presentation. Excellent, so welcome everybody. So glad to uh, see you all here. Um, so we're gonna start with a poll. We always like to see who's here with us. Um, so we're gonna have you, uh, it'll pop up for you and really just what is your primary role right now? And then how long have you been in GME? And not necessarily just in your current role, um, but just in GME in general. So we can kind of feel for where people are coming from and what their experience is. Great. I'll wait for Jenny to let me know what our results on that are. Excellent. Awesome. So it's nice to see when we've got a nice group of uh, a diversity here, people in all kinds of different roles. Excellent. All right. And then next, oh, I apologize, my mouse is being a little picky here. Sorry, Jenny, my uh, mouse is being a little bit there we, there we go. All right, sorry about that. All right, and then our second audience poll, this is the third in a series of webinars, and I'm just really curious who's been with us before. Always excited to have people come on back in and, uh, and see us. So hopefully if you attended the other ones, you found them helpful and thought it'd be worthwhile to come back today. And we'll talk a little bit about what our upcoming webinars coming up are as well. Excellent. Well, welcome back to those of you who have come. It looks like a good chunk of people have been to at least one of our other webinars, so that's exciting. All right. So if you uh, uh, are not familiar with our other webinars. Um, we had one in December and one in January. You can see those at the top of the list. If you would like to review those, they've been recorded and they can be found at the STFM uh, website in our CBME toolbox, um, which I know that uh, Jenny is going to put a link to that in the in the chat for you. And then, of course, today we're on the Let's Talk About Entrustment. Um, and then you can see we've got several other ones that are going to be coming up approximately once per month. So please feel free to check out some of those uh, webinars as well. And then um, just to remind people about the task force. So basically, the STFM CBME task force has been charged with this responsibility to develop faculty development um, and incorporating best practices for implementing CBME in family medicine residency. So part of that has been developing some national guidelines for implementation, um, and that's currently um, been submitted to family medicine and is in the revision process. Um, we have several members of the task force who are presenting um, at both RLS and at the STFM annual conference this spring. So please feel free if you're at either of those conferences to come and check us out at those various uh, presentations. We've got this webinar series. We also have the CBM toolkit, which is available on the website, um, which has a variety of information about CBME, but also includes a lot of assessment and implementation, implementation tools. Um, we also have the faculty development delivered workshops. If you're not familiar with those, you can reach out and request for STFM um, to have one of our faculty members actually come out and do live or virtual, if that works better for you, workshops around CBME, either half day or full day. And so that's something that's available if you want to have someone from STFM actually come out and do some faculty development for your program. And then the final thing that we're working on is in development is a direct observation tool that's integrated into 
um, some current residency electronic management software. So we are in um, development and discussion with both MedHub and New Innovations for putting in this direct observation tool. Um, if you have gotten some uh, on the AMFRD listserv or in some of the STFM collaboratives, you've seen um, some announcements about a pilot program. This is for utilization for that pilot program. So if that's something you're interested in, let us know. So our learning objectives really are to define entrustment as it relates to CBME, describe some of the, the five different levels of a five-level entrustability scale, and describe some of the components of entrustment decisions linked to milestones. So as we get started, I do want to ask people to think about what entrustment, what does entrustment mean to you? Um, I think this is a buzzword that's been coming around a lot for several months, particularly with Dr. Um, Newton really kind of requiring this of us going forward, this concept of entrustment. And I think it's a word that has a lot of weight to it and has really generated a lot of discussion. So thinking about what that means to you. Consider a specific procedure or other patient care activity that you currently assess residents in. And think about for you personally, what would a resident need to show or demonstrate for you to feel comfortable or even confident in saying that this resident could perform that activity unsupervised from now on. Because when we're thinking about entrustment, that's really what we're thinking about. So to get into a little bit of some of the history and theory parts around entrustment, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren. I have to mute myself. So we're going to talk a little bit about the historical con uh, concept of entrustment and a little bit about EPA. So traditionally in medical education, we've used time as a proxy for competence. So if you spend some a lot of time doing something, you'll become proficient in that thing. So we often say when you're a senior, you could be on night float. So kind of an, uh, uh, an idea of scheduled entrustment. So you finished your first year, therefore you can be the senior on no night float. But we know that everybody le uh, learns on a different pace. So think about the developmental milestones in children. So some babies walk at nine months, some at 15, and that's fine. It is the same with learning. It's a journey where everyone progresses at a different speed and furthermore at a different speed for each skill. The same baby who walked at nine months may not have their three words at 12 months, but the baby who won't walk until 15 months may have their three words at 12 months. So using a time, a time as a proxy for competence is dangerous for a few reasons. So first, there's the obvious patient care or patient safety concern. So if we go back to that night float example, um, when a resident becomes a PGY2, they're able to be the senior on night flow. Among the group of residents that you have, there's going to be a wide range of competence. So you'll definitely have those nine month walkers who will be able to be independent, but you also have those kind of those 15 month walkers who will not yet possess the competence needed to function as the senior. So they may be called to the bedside and not recognize something and therefore not be able to take care of the patient um, because they haven't reached the competency to do that. And it's very normal for everyone to progress differently, but we like to treat kind of all of our residents as the 12 month walkers, right? And this delays the success of both the nine month and the 15 month walkers as the example. And a second key issue, um, and I think this is really important, we often don't talk about this, is the confidence of the residents. So we want them to feel fully capable um, and we also want them to feel safe to learn. And if we push the 15 month walkers into that 12 month role, um, they'll either hide what they're not capable of doing, or they'll believe that something is wrong with them. And those are both very dangerous. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is entrustment. Um, it kind of removes this strict time frame from the equation. So next slide. So this is the definition of entrustment that we're going to kind of use today. Um, uh, intentional decision that a learner has sufficient experience, possesses adequate knowledge, and demonstrates the necess necessary skills to be permitted to practice without supervision. So again, really the idea about independence and practicing unsupervised. Um, right now, let's take kind of a quick step back and kind of talk about where this idea started from as a historical context. Oh, perfect. Um, so how did we get here? How did we get here to, from today? So. Um, Dr. Tenkati is a medical educator from the Netherlands. Um, he's been very, very instrumental in CBME. Um, he's written a ton about the idea of entrustment uh, and a lot of the key articles um, have come from him. So he developed uh, in 2005, the idea of entrustment. Um, 
And what he did is he made explicit these everyday judgments that faculty make when regarding when to trust a learner. So asking the questions like, has the learner demonstrated the necessary knowledge, skills, and attitudes or the competency to be trusted to perform this activity unsupervised, so independently? Do they have that required ability? And through this, he kind of de developed this idea of these EPAs or entrustable professional activities. Um, these are the routine or everyday professional activities of physicians based upon their specialty. Uh, so the EPAs here in family medicine look really different than those in radiology or surgery or urology. Um, you can see some of the examples kind of on the right hand of the slide or the right part of the slide. Um, EPAs are observable, they're measurable, they're task-based, and they're suitable to make entrustment decisions. And so that's a really key point. Um, they are common to everyone. So if you think about your week in clinic or your, your week on inpatient, they're the things that you kind of do over and over again um, within your specialty. So next, oh, actually one more thing. So sorry, can we go back for one more moment? Sorry about that. So these are, we're going to talk about EPAs, and I know everyone is going to have a ton of questions around how we are going to be moving towards the ABFM um, outcomes, and we will get to that. But right now, we're just going to kind of talk about that historical kind of context of the EPAs, and we'll get to the ABFM core outcomes in a few minutes. So I just wanted to, before we get a bunch of questions in the chat about that. So in the literature, there's two types of entrustment that are described. So the first one is this idea of ad hoc or on the fly entrustment. So these are the decisions that happen every day, all the time, um, kind of situational entrustment, if you will, um, more formative. Um, you kind of almost don't think about them happening. Um, so let's take discharging a patient as an example. So in this situation, a faculty member makes an in the moment decision to let a PGY1 discharge a patient. Why would they do that? It's a mix of kind of estimated trustworthiness. So maybe from previous interactions with this resident, uh, the risk of the situation, the urgency of the situation, kind of all of these things kind of come together and the faculty member in that moment makes that decision to allow or not allow that uh, resident to discharge the patient. Again, these are happening all the time, almost without our knowledge. Um, for those of us who are parents, we also do this all the time. So let's say after I get home from work today, I let my daughter, ride her bike around the block. Um, I do this because I say, well, it's still light out. The ground is dry. She knows how to ride a bike. She knows the safety rules. Um, so I make this decision today to independently let her do that. Um, but this is kind of that in the moment. So this doesn't necessarily hold true for tomorrow or the next day or next week. It's just today. But maybe over time, I keep letting her ride her bike. Um, maybe with less stipulations. Maybe I say you can go around five times or you can go a little bit further. Um, the idea that kind of trust builds trust. Um, and then these decisions eventually build on one another and it moves towards like proficiency, right? On the other end is this idea of summative or structural entrustment. So these are grounded in more data. Um, so for a running example, a resident must be supervised on more complex discharges, gradually building towards full entrustability through direct observation. So they're being observed discharging patients, maybe by multiple attendings in multiple different scenarios um, until you can kind of say they're independent um, to do this by themselves. Uh, in the parenting realm, this would be where I tell my daughter, you are now allowed to ride your bike around the block without asking me. I have given you this to do this independently. Between these two, the ad hoc and the summative, it feels like there is kind of this other level of entrustment, um, like a progressive entrustment, um, the baby steps of entrustment. So moving from kind of the direct observation um, and then moving towards independence, like, you know, pulling back supervision over time. And we're going to get to that in a minute when we talk a little bit about entrustment scales, but just kind of hold tight with that thought. Uh, next slide. Um, and so how, how do we make entrustment decisions? Where do they come from? So what affects them? So as a faculty member, you're kind of deciding what is an manageable amount of risk in this situation to allow them or at what level are you allowing them to do something? So on top of that, different faculty are going to look at the same resident different ways. Um, and there's just a few different things that affect it. So 
let's keep with the idea of discharging a patient. So a PGY-1 on the second month of inpatient may be entrusted to do that for the most part. But let's say that they are having a bad day or they look really, really tired or they've just come off of a really rough rotation. Maybe you send a PGY-3 with them that day. Or maybe they're in a situation that they've never encountered for or encountered before, like doing some kind of a complex discharge. Or maybe they're in a, um, a shared room, the patient, or maybe there's family members that have been asking a lot of questions there. So you want to make sure that there's somebody with them. So again, there's a lot of like contextual things that go on in these entrustment decisions. And then the attending themselves, like we said, matter too. Um, some uh, attendings will just confer entrustment differently. Um, what is the uh, uh, faculty member's experience with that, um, with supervision, with the clinical context of the situation. Again, all of these little things matter into what kind of um, trust and entrustment decisions are being made um, and how this is all being affected. So a quick summary before we kind of move on to entrustment scales. Um, and how this kind of all relates into the world of CBME. So entrustment focuses us on the competency in relation to a specified outcome rather than time spent. So again, this idea that time does not equal competence, um, which is a major principle in um, CBME. And assessing learners and the actual work that physicians do is really, really key to making entrustment decisions. Um, CBME allows for more individualized curriculum, and pays for learners. Uh, and each learner can reach certain thresholds at different times. So again, back to like our Walker example, everybody's kind of on a different trajectory of learning. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about assessment in a bit, but I wanna, and we also have another webinar um, coming up on assessment, but we're gonna talk a little bit about entrustment scales right now. So entrustment scales sometimes are referred to as independence rating scales. Um, they're behaviorally anchored scales that are used to measure progression towards competence. Um, they're focused on readiness to complete a certain task and not on deficiency, which is a really, really key point that we'll kind of come back to. Um, so what stage are the, are the learners at currently compared to what they will need to be when they're independent? Um, and this brings me back to kind of this idea of this, um, the different types of entrustment. So this is really where we kind of think about that idea of progressive entrustment. So where there is this outlined kind of trajectory and we're pulling back supervision over time. So when the intern starts, they may be doing a lot more watching, um, you know, or the resident, you know, the physician is always there watching, and then over time again pulling back. So maybe it's indirect supervision, or you know, indirect with supervision available. So again, this idea of this this scale. Um, oh, next slide. So here's examples of two different entrustment scales that have been used for procedures. So the Zwish entrustment scale um, was developed by actually a thoracic surgeon. Um, and it is kind of around the amount of guidance needed to be provided by the faculty member specifically in the OR. But you can really see it's, it's easy to use and kind of see that, that level, starting with just watching and then participating a little bit more and then doing the procedure independently. Um, on the other side, there is the O-score. It's again, very, very similar to Zwish. It's used in surgery. It's just, again, another idea of this progressive entrustment. Um, and what I really like about these scales is it, it's easy for faculty uh, to fill out. Um, there's literature to say that supervisors have said that it, they find increased meaning in their assessment decisions using these types of scales because the idea of um, construct alignment. And so what construct alignment is, is it's when the assessment tool aligns with the expertise and priorities of the faculty, um, it's easier to use. Uh, the entrustment, just it, they find it easy and natural. Oh, next slide. So I, I just really, really briefly want to talk about this because I, I think this is kind of also key is how entrustment scales are helpful versus some of the more traditional ways, uh, scales that we have used. Um, you know, we know that faculty struggle with assessment in terms of assigning scores. So sometimes, you know, it's one, two, or three or below at above expectations. And then we never really understand what the difference between a two or a three is. Um, or, you know, is somebody at expectations below, you know, they're right there. Um, it's really, really hard to discern. 
um, it is hard among faculty to kind of understand and get a shared mental model around what constitutes certain ratings. Um, but using entrustment scales, I think allows faculty to answer those questions. Um, is this resident doing this independently without me? Yes or no, or what level am I participating in this? Um, it's so natural. I think that uh, people just do it and they don't even know that this is kind of what they're doing in their mind. And so it's a very easy scale to use for a lot of faculty members. So next slide. Um, the benefits of entrustment scales, there, there's a lot of them. I just wanna kind of pull out a few of them. Um, first, and I think again, this is really key, is this focus on readiness for independent practice and not highlighting the deficiencies of the resident or comparing them to their peers. Um, a study actually found that residents were more comfortable receiving lower scores on assessments that used entrustment scales. Uh, the residents said that they that these types of assessments made it clear to them where they needed to improve on. Um, also, multiple studies have found that entrustment scales increase reliability. The idea of what um, the resident does to, or where they need to be supervised is a natural, again, that natural progression in, in faculty's mind and something that they already use. Um, and then some educators and some and research has shown that it actually takes less time to train raters um, using these scales. Because again, you're not deciding what a two or a three is. You're kind of saying, you know, at this point, how much did you need to help? Um, and finally, entrustment scales will kind of allow for that programmatic um, look across time and across learners to see where everybody is at, which is which is really, really helpful. Uh, next slide. So I love this table. Um, uh, we kind of just looked at some examples of entrustment scales, um, mainly for procedures. And now we're kind of going to switch gears and talk about uh, the ACGME supervision scale. Uh, as well as our new family medicine entrustment levels. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Chris Emily. Excellent, thank you, Lauren. So nice to have a little bit of a background of kind of where this concept of entrustment came from um, and really how it's been used in a few other places. And I'm gonna spend the next little bit talking a little bit about entrustment kind of within the context of family medicine. Um, I think entrustment can sometimes be easy to interpret for procedural skills or surgical uh, procedures, but sometimes can feel a little bit um, less obvious when we're talking about it in the context of family medicine. So entrustment, when it comes right down to it, is really just a decision about a resident's readiness to perform some aspect of professional practice without supervision. And this may be, again, we talk about some of that ad hoc or in the moment entrustment, maybe a decision about um, a resident's ability to go see a patient um, make an assessment in clinic or in the hospital without um, the attending being right there, all the way up to making a decision that a resident is ready for full independent practice. When we talk about entrustment, we inherently talk about supervision. So I want to just remind people about the ACGME levels of supervision. Some people may be very familiar with this, but knowing that we have a bit of a variability within our group, um, I just wanted to review. So you have direct supervision, which basically just means the attending is physically in the room with the resident and the patient. The level of participation may vary, but the important piece is the resident or the is that the attending is in the room. Then you have indirect supervision with direct supervision immediately available. So in this case, the attending is in the building, they're nearby, they could be brought over almost instantly to come and provide that direct supervision in the room. You have indirect supervision where direct supervision is available, but maybe not immediately. So in this case, the attending may be out of the building or if it's a really big building, really far away in the building, um, but they're available by phone or some other immediate communicative device, text, page, et cetera, and would be able to come and provide direct supervision, just not quite as quickly as um, immediately available. And then finally, you have this oversight supervision where the attending really is kind of reviewing things after the fact and was not necessarily available during the actual procedure. And I'm sure you can think of all kinds of situations where you have provided this type, these types of supervision levels to residents at various um, levels and at various uh, times in their training. Um, supervision becomes really important because when we talk about entrustment, we're talking about this idea of having decreased levels of supervision necessary right up to the point where they don't need supervision. 
And what often comes up when I have these conversations with people is people go, but I have to supervise them because CMS says I have to supervise them, or I have to supervise them because ACGME says they need to be supervised. And so what I really want to emphasize is that when we're talking about an entrustment decision, that decision is independent of whether you need to be in the room to bill a 99214 or whether, you know, ACGME says, well, they need to have some uh, indirect supervision. It's really about if all other things were equal, those pieces weren't there, would you say that this resident is ready to do this by themselves? And if you think about it, we've all had those third year residents that you know they're near the end of their training and you tell them, you could just go in and do this all by yourself. I know you could. I have to be here because we're in a training program, but I know you could do this without me. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about that kind of like summative end of the game and trust fund. So yes, sometimes we have to continue to provide supervision because of regulatory requirements, but that in and of itself doesn't mean that a resident could not be considered entrusted or ready for that duty themselves. So our job, our job is to provide appropriate training. And I think we all agree with this. This is, this is a big part of what we do as faculty. Part of our job is to supervise residents um, and to do that at appropriate levels until they've demonstrated resident readiness to perform professional activities independently. And I think we all agree that's also a really big part of our job. But finally, part of our job is to attest to that readiness for independent practice at the end of training. And I think this is the piece of our job that some of us feel a little uncomfortable with because there really is this kind of like risk or gamble of saying that, yes, they really are ready. And Will's agree that Ultimately, the program director has this job, um, but certainly I think all of us as faculty know that we play a part in helping to inform the decision um, of that program director. And this is really where entrustment comes into play. So is it an assessment or is it an entrustment? I'm gonna be splitting a little bit of hairs here because technically you could say that entrustment is a type of assessment. But when I'm talking about assessment, it's looking at a single instance. And I'm gonna use instance in a very broad way. So instance could be something as simple as you're gonna assess how they do a joint injection, or you're going to maybe assess how they take a history, some very small piece of a professional activity. Or it may be a single instance in case of you're looking how they performed on a rotation. So you're looking at a lot of different pieces, but it's this kind of single in the moment instance of being on a rotation. And the purpose of these assessments is to provide feedback to guide individual learning plans and really identify where learners stand. These assessments in and of themselves provide those pieces of data, but any one assessment doesn't make or break anything, right? We, we are looking at multiple assessments when we start to think about more summative things like entrustment. So entrustment, when we talk about that kind of structural entrustment, uses multiple assessments. Like you should probably never make a promotion decision based on one assessment, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. The assessments happen over time. They happen with multiple assessors looking at a pattern of performance. Um, and the purpose is really to make a determination of a learner's readiness to practice independently. Um, and so when we're talking about entrustment, we really are looking at a lot of data pieces to make a decision about the future practice for a resident. So let's look at this in kind of a small scale way. So thinking about interns coming in with varying experience with speculum exams. Again, thinking kind of procedurally oriented because when we talk about entrustment, sometimes it's easier to think about that initially. So this entrustment question is, is this intern in front of me ready to perform this professional activity, a speculum exam, without having an attending in the room? We know when our interns come in, some of them may have had really robust uh, rotations in medical school. Maybe they had lots of opportunities to perform speculum exams, and maybe they could do that without anybody um, you know, directly observing them. Or maybe you've got some interns who just for whatever reason, did not have a lot of opportunities to do speculum exams. Maybe they only did it in simulated ways. And so really you're kind of in this spot where you're like, how do you make this decision? You could say, well, after you've been in clinic for three months, we've decided you can do that by yourself. But again, thinking back to this, some people walk at 12 months and some people walk at 15 months, that really doesn't necessarily tell you if an intern is competent to do that without an attending. So how could we put that together for entrustment? So you could say, well, they all need to have a minimum number of directly observed speculum exams. 
I'm not going to get into a discussion about what that number should be because there's lots of things that could go into that decision, but just saying some minimum number. And on those directly observed exams, we're going to assess the knowledge of the procedure, how they counseled the patient, their actual procedural skills of managing the speculum, how they manage the results of the, of the test that they got from that speculum exam. And the resident gets feedback after each direct observation. So we're making an assessment, we're providing feedback so the resident can make adjustments. And then at the end of that minimum number, faculty kind of review those multiple assessments over time to determine readiness to perform future speculum exams without direct observation. So again, this opportunity to go from having to have direct supervision to maybe having a level of indirect supervision where the um, attending could be in the preceptor room, for example. Now, one of the things that's important is, again, the minimum number is the minimum number. It may not be the maximum number. So there was a study done with GI fellows. Now, more complex procedure, but it was for colonoscopies. And they had a minimum number of 125 that had to be observed, because again, much more complicated procedure, to be at a point where they could be assessed for entrustment. And what they found was that to get all of their fellows through, they needed to have up to 500 observed things. So that didn't mean everybody needed 500, but it meant at least one of their fellows needed 500. So there can be a great deal of variability. Not saying everybody needs to have 500 speculum exams, but again, it doesn't have to be that everybody did it in the minimum number for it to be appropriate. So those assessments that we do in that small scale assessment, you know, maybe we evaluate their procedural skills using something like the procedural um, competency assessment tool. Maybe we observe them in simulation. Maybe we use multi-source feedback to get information from patients and, and clinical staff about how they counseled and spoke with the patient, how they managed their results and how they assess the results using an assessment clinical reasoning tool. So again, all of these individual assessment pieces that then come into play to make an entrustment decision. So applying an entrustment scale. So Lauren showed us a few entrustment scales that are out there. This is another very generic assessment um, assessment tool. So Ten Kadi, you'll see his name pop up all over the place on this particular um, presentation. This particular paper was a review of at least 15, if not 20, entrustment scales. So if you really want to see a you know kind of a lot of variations on the theme, um, I encourage you to check out the paper. It's very informative. Um, but for the purpose of this example, we could say, hey, now at this point, we think this resident who we have determined, you know, has the medical knowledge, has the clinical skills, the communication skills, and knows what to do with the results, they can act under indirect reactive supervision. We've made an entrustment decision that going forward they can do this, okay? So you're probably thinking to yourself that that sounds like stuff you do, right? You do this already. We do this every day. Every day we make these small scale entrustment decisions. We assess a resident's performance in the moment. We make decisions about ad hoc supervision requirements. As CCCs and other um, groups that are making decisions about assessment um, with regards to milestones and competence, we consider overall patterns of performance by looking at multiple assessments over time. And that's the same thing you're gonna do when you're making entrustment decisions. We make decisions in faculty all the time about how much time we need to be in the room. One of the benefits of utilizing a slightly more formalized entrustment process, including an entrustment scale, is it provides a little bit of reliability and understanding for both your learners and your faculty. When I was an intern, I was seeing patients in the office. Um, I had been seeing them all afternoon. I went to the preceptor to kind of run my list after I had seen three patients. And he looked at me and he said, who said that you could go and just see patients without seeing me in between every patient? And that was a really good question. And I didn't have a good answer except, well, the last preceptor let me do that. So one of the reasons for having these types of entrustment scales is it helps all the faculty be on the same page of what the expectation of supervision is for each resident. Um, and that can be really important for helping residents know where they are and knowing what those expectations are and also for kind of a shared mental model among faculty. So we've talked about this small scale entrustment. So let's take it up a notch. So practice as personal physicians providing first contact comprehensive and continuity care to include excellent doctor-patient relationships, excellent care of chronic disease, and routine preventive and effective practice management. Whew, that was a whole lot. 
So for those who do not recognize this, this is the first of the core outcomes from the ABFM. So you can see it's very comprehensive. It's a lot more to it than just a simple speculum exam, but a lot of the concepts of entrustment fit in here as well. Ultimately, the ask from the ABFM is at the end of training, and that's really important, the end of training, not day one, not the middle, not almost through third year. At the end of training, we attest that a resident can be entrusted, so is ready to perform each core outcome independently, so without supervision. That's really what the ask is. That's what they need to have in order to sit for the ABFM board exam. So as we think about that, I go back to the initial question. What would a resident need to show or demonstrate for you to feel comfortable or even confident in saying that this resident could perform that activity unsupervised from now on? Because that is what is being asked of you. And I think when people see that, the first thing people say to me is, but what if I'm wrong? And I get that. As physicians, we are very keen on liability and risk. And we worry about if we say, hey, this person wasn't trusted. But think back to what our job is. Part of our job is to attest to that. It is to train them, it is to supervise them all the way up until we can say you don't need to be supervised anymore. So one of the most important things that we need to do as we think about this entrustment piece is go back to, well, what does a resident need to show me? What do I need to assess? How will I feel comfortable? Because you know you've had residents that you're like, I know they're ready. I, I, I would totally trust this person to take care of my family member. And with entrustment, we're asking you to make sure you have some assessment data that helps to back up that intuition that you know. And remember, you're already kind of doing this. So if you recognize here, we've got seven of the sub-competencies um, and milestones. These are the ones that are mapped to that first core outcome that I just showed you. So one of the things that the STFM CBME task force has been doing is doing this mapping project where we've taken all of the core outcomes from the ABFM and we have mapped them towards um, the milestones that are affiliated to them. So you're already doing some of these assessment pieces. We have been assessing milestones for more than a decade. We've been assessing milestones 2.0 for more than four years. So you're doing this. And how do you assess those milestones? This is not comprehensive, but it's just a few things that you're already doing. So I want people to feel like this is not out of the blue. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's really taking some of the things that you're already doing and putting it in place to help you have the data necessary for you to feel comfortable to say, at the end of training, these residents are ready to be independent. Now, fortunately for the first year, it's just the first five. And if you look through those first five, you'll see, you know what, when you really look at them, there are a lot of things you've been assessing on these residents for the last two and a half years. So, you know, you have that data there and you can take a look and see, am I missing something that you need to add? In the end, you have this kind of final entrustment decision. So looking at all of the assessment data available, is it reasonable to say that this resident in front of me can practice independently. And if not, you have to ask yourself, well, why not? Why can't this resident practice independently? Sometimes it will be because of the status of the resident. So maybe it will be, you know what, this resident hasn't quite demonstrated to me that they know how to manage some of these conditions, or they haven't demonstrated to me yet that they have the medical knowledge necessary. The assessments that we've got, they just they're just not there yet. And that's okay. This is why we do routine assessment times. This is why the CCC meets every six months to kind of look at that data. So then you can say, all right, so in CBME, where we're learner-centered and we have some flexibility, how can we take some elective time? How can we create other educational and clinical opportunities where they have the chance to develop those skills that they haven't yet developed? Again, it's about identifying that level of readiness and being able to create an environment that helps your resident get there. If you look at the resident and you're like, I actually really think they're ready, I, I really do. But looking at the data I have, I just don't have enough of that data. Like if someone were gonna say, well, why do you think they are ready for independence? And you're like, oh, I just feel like they are. 
then I think one of the things that is important is we don't promote by default. You need to have some of that assessment data there. So just like when the milestones came out and we started trying to level residents and some of us went, huh, we don't really have a whole lot of assessment pieces on this particular systems-based practice um, sub-competency. It may be that you have to look at kind of programmatically, what are we not assessing that we need to? And how can I put that in place so that when we get to that point where I say this resident can practice independently, it's not just based on my gut feeling, but it's based on this data that I have. So all of those kind of pieces fit into that entrustment decision. There's a lot of information today. Entrustment, we could have a whole conference just on entrustment. So if you remember nothing else, competency cannot be determined by time alone. You need to have some assessment data. You need to observe your residents. You need to have those things in place so that you can kind of defend that, that yeah, when they get to the end of second year, they're ready for that night flow rotation. Entrustment is a discrete decision. So when you talk about entrustment for that kind of summative structural entrustment. Either they are ready or they are not. If they are almost ready, then they're not ready, okay? It's a discrete decision and it should be based on multiple assessments. You should never be making a structural entrustment assessment or decision based on one assessment. That's not fair to your learner. That's not fair to your patients um, and really needs to be thought out more. The entrustment scales allow for this kind of gradual decrease in supervision until they're ready for fully independent practice. And finally, you already do a lot of this. So don't let perfect get in the way of good. Take a look at your assessments. Take a look at the ones that are working really well for you and seek out ones through the toolkit. Come to RLS, come to the annual STFM conference, talk to other programs and figure out what other assessments you might still need. Um, there's also going to be a webinar on assessment, so I highly recommend you check that out as well. And then as you bring this home, engage both your residents and your faculty. We talk about faculty development, and this is about faculty development, but it's also about your resident development. So start to have a conversation about entrustment with both your faculty and your residents. Is there a difference between resident and faculty viewpoints? What did they identify as some of the challenges for determining entrustability? Because these conversations about entrustability become really important. Wait, what about the EPAs? I did promise I would tell you about the EPAs. When the core outcomes came out, and this got addressed a little bit in that initial webinar that we had, there was this question about the EPAs and core outcomes and what does it mean? So I like to think about EPAs in a couple of ways. So we have kind of the historical context of EPA for which Lauren gave us a nice description. Tinkati's initial kind of thought was not specific to family medicine. And it was really this idea that you could identify and create um, assessments around very specific professional activities. Many specialties, including family medicine, pediatrics, surgery, ultimately came up with a list of kind of formal, what I call capital letter EPAs. And those are the 20 EPAs that were created by the Family Medicine for America's Health. What has ultimately been decided with discussion with ACGME and ABFM is that we're gonna sunset those 20 formal EPAs in favor of the core outcomes. Many of the core outcomes incorporate a lot of the things that were in those formal EPAs. So when we talk about sunsetting EPAs, it's those very specific EPAs. When we talk about the historical context of kind of what I call the lowercase EPAs, which really are things like, think about that small case entrustment of the um, speculum exam. That could be just a small EPA. It's an entrustable activity that you could determine entrustment for. There may be spaces within your program where you do that for certain procedures or other things where you create kind of this small level entrustment scale. And you may see EPAs brought up in the literature and that's kind of what they're talking about. So I know that there's been some confusion around that. So big formal EPAs from the Family Medicine of America's Health have been sunsetted in favor of the core outcomes. Little case EPAs of assessment tools used for work-based assessment can still be utilized. All right, references, and then I think we'll open up for questions. I thank you everybody for your time. All right.
Jenny, do we have, I don't see questions popping up in the Q&A. All right. Oh, questions. There we go. Yes, this will be available for people to review again. Um, so all of the webinars, once they've been completed, um, will be available on the STFM CBM um, uh, tool, toolkit. And uh, if we need to put that uh, link in the chat again, we can. Um, and then several of us, including Lauren and I, will be at uh, the annual STFM conference. Um, that if people want to come and ask us questions there, they can. Um, so question about there appears to be 15 core outcomes as opposed to 20 EPAs, and that is correct. Um, so there are 15 core outcomes. If you kind of review them, they've taken, they've kind of combined some of the EPAs in the initial list and kind of put them together. As you can recall from the first one that I put on, it's very comprehensive. Um, so yes, 15 core outcomes as opposed to the 20 formal EPAs. Um, in terms of making sure all faculty are in agreement, what is the role of frame of reference training? That's a really good question. I think there's a lot of information in the literature around, um, especially for utilization of the clinical competency committee, because I think that's where people are thinking that a lot of that shared mental um, model is going to come from. So having uh, some of the literature around that I think could be useful in trying to figure out how to make sure all of your faculty are in agreement. Um, I think part of it is a lot of conversations about what different things look like utilizing the milestones in particular as kind of your benchmark. You know, this is what these things look like according to the ACGME. So that can be a place for that. Um, and I don't know, Lauren, if you have some um, other expertise on frame of reference training. You've got, there you go. All right, I was reading some of the other comments. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, I mean, I have a lot of like background literature and things around that. I'm happy to like take the discussion out of here if, if we wanna have a conversation or I can send you um, some different articles, but it, it does, there's so much faculty development to be done around all of this and, and getting everybody on the same page is just, it takes a lot. It does, and it's, and it's you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. And I think that's one of the things that I think is really important is this is an iterative process. You're not gonna have it all perfected right now, and that's okay. Um, let's see here, did new innovations indicate when they might expect to have some content built into their system? So we're, it's going to be pilot. I think the plan is to pilot in June. Um, and, and so again, there have been some things out on AMFRD, um, and the STFM collaborative stuff so that if being part of the pilot is something you're interested in, please reach out, um, for them. Oh, I like this question. How do you handle residents who have been on educational interventions? Do you add up the data points of the past to make your entrustment decisions? Do you ignore and forgive issues of the past and just focus on the current? So I think it really ultimately is if there has been a concern, has that concern been addressed? Have they subsequently demonstrated that they have addressed that issue? If they have not subsequently addressed that issue, then that becomes part of the entrustment discussion. Um, you know, we always talk about those halos and horns when we talk about assessment and some of those challenges with bias. So when you're talking about entrustment, you really are looking at all of that data together. So while you might not necessarily ignore some previous issues, you certainly want to identify that you have data that indicates whatever the issue was has been addressed. Um, anything, Lauren, that you would add to that? Mm -hmm. There's a question about new innovations. I don't know anything about that's okay. Yeah, we're we're gonna the new innovations is in progress. All right. The biggest challenge for EPA is organizing and making sure each resident has achieved some of the core outcomes. 
can this be wrapped into the milestones assessment in an easy way, any practice recommended? So I definitely would recommend you check out the, um, the CBME task force. We have a whole section just on how the core outcomes have been mapped to the milestones and how you can utilize some of the milestone assessments to kind of help with that. So um, that's in the task, uh, the task force's toolbox. And I suggest that. I will, um, I will second that. that. That mapping is incredibly useful. All right. Since encounters are so complicated and involve many steps, is our suggestion on how to plan for your observations? So I strongly recommend that you break it down into little chunks and think about the fact that you really, you know, ultimately when you're starting with your interns, you'll have a nice three years. You've already done a lot of the assessments for your older residents anyways, but think about trying to break things down into more manageable ways. Again, using the milestones as kind of benchmarks of the things that you should be observing, um, you know, so that you're kind of building a case all the way along. I think one of the things that's gonna be most challenging from a CBME perspective is we are very used to kind of providing end of rotation evaluations and end of rotation assessments. And those are really big. So the thought of like having to do a lot of those is really overwhelming. And instead of thinking about how can I do smaller, simpler assessments where I get more pieces of data that I can then kind of put together to give me bigger, bigger pictures down the line. Um, I cannot speak to the double AMC um, uh, undergraduate EPAs, unfortunately. <laughs> Would have to ask them. Um, let's see here. Link to what's expected next year that we can read to catch up. Oh, the, the pilot is specifically a pilot around the direct observation tool that um, STFM's uh, CBME project is um, implementing for new innovations and Med Hub. So it's not the whole thing in particular, it's just one um, observation tool. Um, and then last one here, frame of reference training, nice. Evidence not great for faculty having the same frames, which is completely correct. Um, mm -hmm. And the literature seems to talk about having a small group or one to two three teachers, teachers performing assessments. And I've heard a lot of, um, there's actually been some nice uh, data around having kind of people who've had some additional training specifically in kind of dealing with a large group of heterogeneous data points, and that may be worthwhile for programs as well. So thank you, Janice. I appreciate that comment. And I want to, there, Janice, I think you're talking about the videos that Eric has um, where you have the faculty watch and rate. And I think that is, if, if, if folks have not done that, it is eye-opening uh, to watch like a very short little encounter and then just have all your faculty rate because you will get such a huge variation. And it's it's really interesting to have those conversations with your faculty about why there's such a, a great um, difference in ratings. And that's, it, it's a really good faculty development tool. Do you know um, where people could potentially access that, Lauren? I believe, and I'm going to say this and I can, I can check, but if you go to the ACGME like learning hub, or it's called like learning collaborative, um, they mm -hmm. posted a bunch of videos, which are really, really helpful, like kind of, you know, action points for short faculty development. There's also mm -hmm. the, the, I think it's called the doc. So it's their version of the direct observation. I want to say there's also videos in there that you can use, um, but really great if you have 20 minutes to spend with faculty to kind of watch something and have that kind of discussion. Excellent. Um, and someone is about the using, uh, they use the My Tip report, which I've heard of, but I'm not super oh, familiar wow. of to assess residents and to assess residents in the moment, consideration on collaboration. Um, certainly we can bring that back to the task force and see if there's some possibilities for that. Oh yes, oh, somebody just so posted much. the toolkit. People have put the toolkit in for us. So um, uh, Jenny, I'm not sure if those things go, go into the chat. Do you, if you see the, um, the links that are in the Q&A, if we could put those in the chat for people, that would be wonderful. Yeah, they've recently just done a ton of a ton of videos, um, which are are helpful. Excellent, awesome. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention and your wonderful questions. Um, you know, if things come up after the fact, like I said, Lauren and I are going to be at a few of the conferences. You can feel free to come and uh and chat us up. We would be happy to continue that conversation.
Excellent. Thank you. All right, Jenny.